Okay, welcome uh, to this afternoon session. I understand I am the only thing that separates you from the wine later. Um, I'll try to make it enjoyable. Um, so it's a great honor to be part of this um, school. Um, I'm here to uh, um, replace Hans Lindström, um, who's of course one of the leading experts in the questions on the Cauchy problem. So for those of you who may think that they miss out on something, I will recommend you warmly his uh, excellent book on the Cauchy problem in general relativity that has exactly this name, where you find plenty of uh, um, aspects that I will not particularly mention because I decide to take a bit of a different approach because this other approach is well represented in his book and uh, I can, as I said, warmly recommend it to you to take a look at this. Nevertheless, the main ideas that are contained in this field I'll try to mention and um, hope to succeed with that. So the outline um, of my talk is as follows. It has four sections. So the first one I would call geometric well-posedness. And the second one, CMCS. CMCSH gauge. So I'll tell you in a minute what that means. Then I will speak about local existence. in CS, CMC SH gauge. And finally, about nonlinear stability of the so-called Milne model. So, um, if you want to have an idea about what I want to achieve in these different sections or what they will be mainly concerned with, because that's mostly the question that one has if one sits in, in the audience is what does he want from me? And uh, I tell you, so here I would like to give you a general idea that the evolution problem in GR is well understood geometrically in some sense. Um, but you have heard in many talks already that if you want to evolve Einstein equations, you need to fix a gauge. And which gauge you fix will cast the Einstein equations in, a very, in very different systems, let's say. So I will take a specific one and tell you how it works. Okay? And this gauge is the so-called CMCSH gauge that was set up by Lars Anderson and Vince Moncrief to derive a full program of proving this mill stability problem. So I will explain you what this gauge is. Then I will sketch a proof of local existence in this gauge. And finally, I will give you the main idea behind the proof of non-disability of the Milne model. What all these things mean, I will try to explain in the course of this talk. So. These three talks. This is not about, This is not happening today. Yeah. Okay. So it's just part of it. Um, so I'll try to uh, pick you up from a place that you've been before. That's initial data. Um, so let's see how do we get to the initial data. Let, I will say a few things that um, we've said before. Yeah? So consider a four-dimensional. Lorentzian manifold that I will always denote by m bar g bar, has signature minus 1, 1, 1, 1. Because I'm doing the relativity in the physical dimension, we impose the vacuum Einstein equations. Yeah? So the vacuum Einstein equations reduced to this, where our bar mu nu is the Ricci tensor. That's not new. Um, so we've learned already that uh, a globally hyperbolic space-time, which is the class of space-times that we are interested in, 
has a certain topology. This you learned in the talk of Greg Galloway yesterday. So let M, now without a bar, this denotes my spatial hypersurface. Be a space-like submanifold. of M bar, and we impose that M bar has the topology R cross M. That's fair to do because global hyperbolic space times take have this topology. Now, we express G with respect to local coordinates. Let's choose these coordinates. on M bar such that X naught is a time coordinate. That means it's constant on the M surfaces and X alpha are coordinates on M. So with respect to such a coordinate system, we then write a general ansatz for the Lorentzian metric in the following form. G bar equal to minus N square DT square plus GAB DXA plus XA DT DXB plus xb dt. So that's a general Lorentzian metric. And I'm writing it in this way. This is the so-called ADM formalism because it's, we will understand what these quantities means in some intuitive way in the following. So n is called the, so, is the lapse function and x called the shift vector field, which if we fix a certain space like hypersurface, those are either a function for n or a vector field on the surface, okay? Now, if n, writing n vector, is a unit normal vector field to m, yeah, to hypersurface, then we can decompose dt in the following way. Here's the lapse, that is the normal vector field, and this is the shift vector. So the lapse, if we compare the dt vector field in a sense with um, the normal vector field to the hypersurface, so the projection on this is n, that's this function n, and x is sort of the tilt to the side. Yeah? That's like an intuitive way to think about it. Um, how we can compare uh, dt and n, but in principle we can nevertheless write any Lorentzian metric like this. But in a sense, n and x tell you, in a sense, how you foliate the space-time. Yeah, that's the job of of the lapse and the shift. Okay, there's another quantity that we need to write down the constrained equations. And that's the second fundamental form. For this metric, we can write it down explicitly the following way. So. So that's the second fundamental form. And now we've learned uh, in the talks of Justin Corvino that um, it look, looks a bit different here, but we'll get, if we impose the Einstein equation, some of these Einstein equations will enforce the two constraint equations on 
the second fundamental form and the metric. By the way, sometimes I will use the term for G physical metric, yeah, because you can associate it in a sense with the metric that you see on a spatial hypersurface. So then the Einstein equations, I abbreviate like this, imply the constraint equations. And those take the following form. Okay. Now, this here is the mean curvature, so I will already now give it a name tau. It plays an important role in what's uh, happening later. But I will repeat this definition again when we need it. So we know by construction that any solution to Einstein's equations, if you reduce them to the spatial hypersurface, if you look what they, what they imply on this spatial hypersurface, on any spatial hypersurface for k and g, it's those equations. So it makes no sense if you want to study and construct um, space times that are solutions to the Einstein equations to start with any other initial data than this. Yeah? So any space time, any initial data you construct from a space time has to be of this form. Now, what's completely unclear is the other way around. This is sort of the evolution problem in GR is if you start with an initial data set that you can define independently of a space time that you use to construct it, you can do the following, just define initial data on a three manifold. So I call this here, I call the system constraint. Yes. Oh, um. That's a d by dt, if you want. I will use notation partial index t to denote that. Yeah, sorry. So OK, that's a, that's a good point already. So let's, let's think, if you think about the second fundamental form, think it is sort of the time derivative of the metric. That's for the evolution, if for evolutionary perspective, that's a, that's a good thing to have in mind. OK, so let's define initial data set. So, consists of a manifold and k uh, symmetric two tensor field on M. So you say is a set, yeah, MGK um, where MG is a Riemannian three manifold such that constraint holds. Such an initial data set does not know anything about the space time it may be uh, associated with. And the question is does every initial data set in this sense has a space time that is its natural evolution, yes? So if I find such an initial data set, if I construct it, you learn many methods here how to construct and analyze those sets, can I evolve it? And it would be nice if we could. So what does it mean to evolve an initial data set? Or to, to, to go with, uh, with the usual um, term for this is how to develop an initial data set. Let's define a development. So 
a development of an initial data set mg not k not is a four dimensional Lorentzian manifold m bar g bar with an embedding I that goes from M to M bar such that the following holds if I pull back the metric G bar by this embedding, I'm getting a metric on uh, I'm, yeah, I'm getting a metric on M, and this should coincide with G naught. And if I pull back capital K, which is the second fundamental form of the image of this embedding, if I pull that back to M, then I'm getting K naught. Yeah, so K, capital K is the second fundamental form of the image of M in M bar. Moreover, if the image of M bar, which is now a surface in uh, of M, is now a surface in M bar, if this is a Cauchy surface, yeah. I'm here. That's fine. Thanks. We call M bar G bar a globally hyperbolic development. And we learned yesterday that one characterization of global hyperbolicity is that there is one Cauchy surface in such a space time. Yeah? So it if it's here, the one that I'm getting by embedding it, then it's, I call this a globally hyperbolic development. And those are the developments that we are interested in. Uh, no, of course, yeah, of course. Um, just a second, so. That goes without saying, but it should be said. <laughs> sure. Right. OK. So now, if we have this notion of development, what would the natural question about existence be formulated? How would it be formulated now? So I'm using a, a piece of this blackboard. So the question now is, does every initial data set mg not k not have a globally hyperbolic development? Yeah? That is the question. And this question is solved. So just a second. Every initial data set has a Globally hyperbol uh, has a globally hyperbolic development, yes. So the proof of this theorem, or the essential step in the proof of this theorem that I'm not going to do is 
um, cast the Einstein equations in a um, system of nonlinear wave equations. using the harmonic gauge. And how to do that and how to prove local existence for the system has been shown by Justin Corvino in his second lecture. So just go to his slides and look at this proof. How such a proof works, I will show you in a slightly different system tomorrow. Yeah? So that's the, essential, that's the essential part of this proof, yeah? plus some other technical steps. And it's excellently um, described in this book of Hans Ringstrom that I recommend you to take a look at. Now, if we, so having this theorem that's reassuring so we can always develop our initial data, we can always find uh, a solution to Einstein equations that really fits to our initial data in this sense. But we don't know whether there may be more than just one. And from a physical theory, we would like to have determinism, so we'd like to have one unique development. But now we have a problem because a development is a manifold and another development may be a different manifold. And now we have to compare different manifolds, different lens and manifolds with each other. And the following notion explains how this can be done. So, This is all in vacuum. This is all in vacuum. If you want to do all this with matter or with a cosmological constant, you can do it for some matter models. It's known how it's done. But in principle, you have to reprove this for any matter model for which this is not yet known. Yeah? So we just talk about vacuum. But in, it's known for a, for a reasonable set of matter models that are currently used in mathematical relativity as well. So. Let m bar, g bar, and i be a development of the initial data set m g naught k naught. Then this is called. maximal globally hyperbolic development, or as it's usually MGHD. If for any other development, M bar prime, G bar prime, and I prime, There exists an orientation preserving diffeomorphism between these two manifolds. I call it psi that goes from m bar prime to m prime uh, to m bar such that I'm trying to squeeze this here two conditions hold first of all the pullback of the metric g bar is equal to g bar prime on the image of this um, map and if i put psi together with i prime I'm getting I. So that means that if I have a development, that's my development, and I'm having, let's say, that's my maximal development, and I'm having a smaller, like a, let's say, in shorter in time, naively, development, I can always view this as a part of this one. Okay? 
So when you find your maximal globally hyperbolic development and there's some other guy who finds something else, then you actually already have what he found. Yeah? That's the idea behind it. So that's in a sense sort of the maximal, so the maximal space time that you can get from a given initial data set. And to finish this, of course, what you expect is true is a theorem by Choquet Bruha. I mean, by the way, this development existence is essentially also Choquet Bruha's theorem, yeah? In 1952. Uh, and Garrosh can say for any initial data set, a maximal globally hyperbolic development exists. Okay. So to prove this is not, is not trivial, but it's very technical, and I'm telling you this just to accept it for the moment, because we just have three hours, and I want you to be relaxed to say, okay, in a sense we can say this answers the question whether the Einstein equations in vacuum are geometrically well posed because whenever I start with an initial data set, I get a unique maximal development up to isometry. I'm not writing this down, but of course, this is always just up to isometry yeah? because you can always find a different manifold, pull back the metric, and it also fulfills the Einstein equations. Yeah? So that means that whatever initial data you construct, there is such an object that's called the MGHD that is your natural development of this initial data set. Now, why don't we stop here and say, okay, that's, that's fine? Well, because it's very abstract. And essentially, the branch of mathematical relativity that is concerned with the Cauchy problem, meaning to developing initial data and to analyzing the manifolds that arise from it, the space-times that arise from it, mainly concerned with understanding how this MGHD looks like. Because so far we just know that it exists. So we have a Lorentzian manifold um, that solves the Einstein equations that is sort of our development of the initial data, but we don't know how it looks like. And let's gather some questions on what we would like to know about this manifold. So we'll tell you now a few questions that we would like to answer, and all of these questions are very difficult in principle. And then after that, I will reduce to essentially one question, and that uh, is the question for the rest of the talk. So let's see, let's see, um, uh, you don't have to, un like, we're not going through all of them, yes? So questions. So when I'm asking these questions, always, of course, for a certain class of initial data. Yeah? So I start with some class of initial data and would like to know what can I say in general about each of the maximal hyperbolic developments that arise from this initial data set. Yeah? So is it, um, time-like and null geodesically? Complete, for instance. This is interesting because any curve in this, um, any geodesic, time-like or uh, null geodesic in the space-time represents particles that can move in the space-time either of mass or of vanishing mass. And uh, we would not like them to end unless, of course, we have a, a meaningful singularity. Yeah? Um, and a meaningful singularity, for instance, in the cosmological sense, uh, a space-time where the spatial hypersurfaces are compact, you have heard about singularities before, would be, for instance, one where the curvature blows up. So this curvature blow up occur in the incomplete directions of space-time. 
So we have a picture if you take um, a three manifold in the positive Yamabe class, there's a conjecture that this will always recollapse from a Big Bang to a Big Crunch. So the Big Bang, for instance, would be then such a singularity, and you would like that if you go towards the singularity, then the curvature, which is essentially the square of the Riemann tensor of the full space time, diverges. Yeah? This is related to strong cosmic censorship um, and ideas like this. But as I said, I'm not going so much into detail here. Regarding black hole formation, one would, for instance, like to know, does the MGHD contain trapped surfaces? And in a question which I already sort of mentioned by what I said before is, is there a relation between the spatial topology of a space-time and its asymptotic behavior. Why is that interesting? Because if we consider the universe as a cosmological solution to, to, solution to Einstein's equations, it would be nice to know um, what topology we live on. And if we observe how the universe evolves, then we would like to take some data from there and uh, then compare it with the mathematics and see whether this can, in some sense, restrict the topologies we could live on. We know there are many three manifolds of different topology, and it would be nice to know which one we live on. Currently, uh, that seems to be difficult. But mathematically, this is, of course, a well-defined question. So, but I would like to restrict this to one question, which um, somehow incorporates parts of these questions. And that's the so-called nonlinear stability problem. And let's say first in words what that means. So you all know Minkowski space-time, and as a physicist, you would like to use the space-time to model certain regions in the actual real space-time. However, you know that there are always perturbations. May it be by different theories, like quantum theories or something that also play a small role somewhere, or by some particles that are in this uh, in this region of space-time. So then you know that this cannot any longer be Minkowski space-time. However, a physicist would argue, okay, that's, that's a small perturbation, and Minkowski space is still a good model for this experiment that we would like to do. However, saying something like this is not actually that simple. So let's agree that we are always at least in a small perturbation of Minkowski space-time, but analyzing a small perturbation of Minkowski space-time you cannot use the metric that you know any longer. You have to use Einstein equations that are certainly fulfilled in this perturbation to tell you how this perturbation actually looks like. Now, if you can prove that this perturbation of Minkowski space, like, uh, of, of Minkowski space still looks like Minkowski space time, essentially, then you're good. Then you can actually use Minkowski space time, right? Because then it's a good approximation, but you don't know because it may be unstable. So what does it mean to, in more mathematical terms, to be, to be stable or unstable? Let's say you fix a t equal constant slice in Minkowski space-time, then you know the initial data that's induced by Minkowski space-time is the Euclidean metric, and k equal to zero, and r3. Yeah? So that's your initial data set. Now, take a small perturbation, so you deviate the metric mildly from Euclidean space, and you deviate k a bit from zero, you have another initial data set. Of course, you have to be careful that this still fulfills the constraint equations, but we learned how we can construct such data and now evolve that perturbation. This may give rise to a completely different space-time. And proving that it does not give rise to a completely different space-time, but to a space-time that asymptotically really looks like Minkowski space is one of the most outstanding results 
ever in mathematical relativity, extremely hard to prove, even though it sounds like a very simple problem. So let's make this a bit more formal. Um, So we consider some epsilon bigger zero, small epsilon bigger zero, and then say, an epsilon perturbation of an initial data set, m g naught k naught, is an initial data set still on the same topological manifold M, but now G naught prime, K naught prime, such that G naught minus G naught prime in some Sobolev space of order S, I will define later what a Sobolev space is, it's a function space, yeah, and this is the appropriate norm. I'll give you the details a bit later. And K naught minus K naught prime is smaller than epsilon for some S sufficiently large, yeah? So, that makes sense to consider this as a perturbation because it's really like you really get a nice open set of other geometries that you can evolve. And now I dare to write down sort of a of nonlinear stability, a definition of nonlinear stability. So there's no such general definition in principle, but I've tried to come up with one that, that may be valid, but in principle it means here and there always a bit of a different statement, yeah? But in principle it means the following. So a space time, M bar, G bar, think of Minkowski space if you want, is nonlinearly stable if the following holds. For a given initial data set, mg naught k naught in this manifold m bar g bar, there exists an epsilon. such that for every epsilon perturbation, which I call now mg naught prime, k naught prime, there exists a time function on M bar and the corresponding foliation MT and T is in R. I continue on the next blackboard. So this foliation is, of course, by t equal constant slices. Yeah. Sorry, what? Can you explain what the H S spaces are? 
already now? Okay, should I do this before yeah. finishing the definition or should I do it? Okay, no, that's fine. I'll okay. You will do it. I, I can do it now, yeah, sure. Because I'm using them again now, yeah. Um, so I'm going to finish such that. G minus G prime in HS plus K minus K prime in HS minus one goes to zero as T goes to infinity where GK and G prime K prime are the data induced on the foliation corresponding to well that's a long definition yeah uh, but uh, that's in principle what it's what it is I will explain it again in a minute on the foliation corresponding to the MGHDs of um, G not K not and G not prime K not prime. So you see, where G K and R the data and use on the foliation corresponding to the MGS of T. Yes. So. Before I define Sobolev space, let's just try to understand this definition. So I have my background space time, let's say Minkowski space. I have the data induced by this background, I call it background space time because that we consider fixed in a sense. That's mg not k naught. Now we look at the small perturbation of this and I have two maximal, maximal globally hyperbolic developments and I compare them on a foliation of the space time r cross m and I want that on the, on, the, on the slices of this foliation, the difference between the background space time, Minkowski space, and the, small the MGHD of the small perturbation goes to zero. And that means if I evolve forward in time, the difference between my new space time and Minkowski space time is going to zero. So the geometry looks more and more and more like Minkowski space time. That's the idea. So to define Sobolev spaces, or um, well, let's say define the norm that's relevant for Sobolev spaces. So let's say having a function here can do this for tensor fields the same way. Um, let's just write it down and explain it in a second. So. Yes. So let's say I want to define a Sobolev space on a manifold. This I have to do in an invariant way. And all I need to define such a space or such a norm is I need a metric. So I take a Riemannian manifold and how do I define uh, then this norm? So I take, a, take the manifold mg. Then this is the volume form. with respect to G, and this is the covariant derivative with respect to G. So I can take the kth derivative of phi, I take the, the norm in G, I square it, I integrate over it, and I sum up to the order of regularity that I want to, want to have. So all functions for, this, for which this is finite, they form a Sobolev space. Now that's not completely correct because you have to do a bit of technical things, but I'm, not, I'm sure this is not uh, so relevant now. So you can think of, of functions that fulfill, fulfill this, um, they have this feature. So now you can think if, sorry? Yes. No, but you can use a foliation of the topological of the topological manifold for which you know that they are the same. Right? Okay. 
But again, this, this definition is a bit daring because in principle, these results differ a bit from here to there. But this is in principle what you would like to prove. Okay, so let me for today maybe um, mention a few to give like credits to people who have uh, worked on the subject a lot. So to mention a few of the milestone results that have been, have been proven. And um, I'm, I seriously hope that I'm not missing, missing someone. So, okay. Okay. yes. I'm just trying to uh, understand the confusion. Maybe what the point is that this is g of e minus g prime of t or something like that. Right? That, 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 is, that was maybe where this question, right? So, so you need to take the metric g at time t and g prime at time t. Oh yes, you mean this yeah. here? In the, in the in your yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah sure sure. So maybe, maybe this was okay okay sure yeah. This is on each slice, of course, yeah. This is on each slice. Yeah. I mean, that was implicit. Yeah, that was implicit. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's true, of course, yeah. Um, so I'm talking about vacuum Einstein equations here because there are plenty of results uh, uh, with meta as well, but... Um, We will not have time for those. So stability of Minkowski space. That's uh, Christodoulou Kleinerman in 93. And then this has been proven again in harmonic gauge. So that's a different approach giving a similar result by Lindblad and Rodniansky. in 05. And yet again by, okay, this is, this is, a, this is with Metro, the first one. By Zipser and Beery, I think in 09. So you see, even proving this result again and improving it mildly and stuff is, uh, is a very difficult works. And uh, another result is the stability of the Mill model that we will discuss later. It's also a solution to the Einstein vacuum equations. That's by Anderson Moncrief in uh, 11. And then there are plenty of results for positive lambda. I include them here because these are they're very successful works on this topic as well. So for cosmological models, with uh, lambda greater or equal to zero. This works by Friedrich in 86 and Anderson in 05. And the most general result on this is by Hans Ringström in 08. And that's a very, very beautiful paper that's uh, easy to read after you've studied his book. I'm sorry? Uh, no, I will mention them later. You saw the, the cur the cur the zitter stability? Yep. Yeah, no, I'll mention that, I'll mention that in a second. Yes, I didn't, I didn't forget that. So there is uh, um, one other area in this field, except for Minkowski stability, cosmological models. Um, and that is uh, probably the most uh, interest, or let's say, the most difficult problem um, 
when it comes to stability that people are studying at the moment. And I would like to also mention that problem briefly. So, thank you. And that is the so-called black hole stability problem. That is still not resolved. However, there are two recent works on this. So the linear stability of Schwarzschild that has been proven by the Fermos and um, Holzegel and Rodniansky in 016. So that's still not the full problem, but a major leap forward. And the other problem that is related is the nonlinear stability of the Kerr de Sitter family. of Hinz and Vashi. So, the linear stability considers the linearization of the system and trying to prove decay of perturbations in that system, so it's still not the full problem. And the nonlinear stability of Kerr de Sitter really analyzes solutions to Einstein equations, so not the linearization. However, they have a positive cosmological constant. And if you have some experience with uh, stability problems, then a, cos a positive cosmological constant always gives you exponential growth, in a sense. And that corresponds to exponential decay of the perturbations. So perturbations decay faster, so it's a considerably, considerably more simple. Yeah? So there are two, um, so that's also an O16. So there is, uh, there is um, promising progress on this problem, um, and it certainly would be a great breakthrough if this would be solved in the, in the next years. Okay. So since the time is over already, let me just uh, uh, sum this up because it ends sort of the introduction in a sense. So, next we want to take a very specific approach, a specific gauge condition, and study the Einstein equations in this gauge condition and prove theorems. Um, what I would like you to keep in mind from this is that even in the general sense, we always have this maximal globally hyperbolic development, and we're going to analyze it starting tomorrow for a cosmological space-time that solves the vacuum Einstein equations proving local existence, and then on Friday, hopefully, proving global existence to the future and stability of these models. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>